Welcome to the Scale Ups Podcast, where each week you get to hear Sean Steele, professional CEO, growth mentor, and advisory board chair, unpack the strategies that successful founders have used to achieve scale in their businesses. Stay tuned as he interviews the entrepreneurs who've made it, learns from industry experts, and follows a group of founders still striving to scale. G'day everyone and welcome to the Scale Ups podcast where we help first time founders learn the secrets of scaling so they can make bigger decisions with greater confidence, fulfill the potential of their business and maximize the value and impact they can create in the world. I'm your host Sean Steele uh, and before we kick off today I've got my fantastic guest here uh, Pete Cleary uh, from the Zinc Group. Looking forward to, um, to getting you on board today. Pete how are you? I'm very well, thanks, mate. Thank you very much for uh, asking mate, me my, to come my today. My pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and before we kick off, uh, just want to acknowledge uh, some of our community. We've been getting lots of reviews uh, through Apple Podcasts. We love Apple. Uh, seems to be the uh, seventy. I think it's seventy five percent of our community are using uh, Apple Podcasts. We've got some lovely reviews and ratings. It just helps it get into the hands of other people. Uh, big shout out to uh, to Lockie who said recently, super insightful and practical interview style. Great to have a guy interviewing that really knows what he's talking about. I love it. Uh, I'm not sure that's entirely true, but at least I, I, I'd fake it till I make it. Uh, Lucky, thanks very much for your comments. Uh, if you're in our community and you're listening to this and you'd love to have yours read out, just jump on Apple Podcasts and drop one there for us. Uh, so to kick off today, uh, as I said, our Pete, uh, our, our Pete today, our guest today is, uh, is Pete Cleary, founder and CEO of Zinc Group. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Zinc Group, maybe just a quick overview from me um, and then uh, Pete, I'd love to really understand a bit more about this journey that you've been on. You started back in 2005, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump actually right up to sort of 2019. At 2019, pre-COVID, uh, you're a marketing business, yep. you're specializing in uh, promotional marketing and merchandising and digital strategy and planning amongst you know, many other things, it, it seems. So examples could have been sure. how we might have seen your work through you know, branded tennis balls at the Australian Open or Toy Story drink bottles at cinemas or, um, you know, or, or lanyards for big events or branded portals for digital campaigns. Would they be some sort of examples that people might have experienced things work yeah absolutely they, they certainly yeah. would be so it was very much around the promotional marketing and brand activation mm -hmm. space um very much our entertainment marketing division is our second um area of our mm -hmm. business which is around licensing and and third party uh intellectual yep. property and then we have a, a loyalty and incentive part of our business right. as well okay. so there, there's activations of what you've just described i'm sure would have Beautiful. been us Beautiful. And at that point, um, you know, business is going well. You're in fastest growing 100 companies. Um, at, the, at that stage, what would, yeah. you, what would the business have looked like just to give people a sense of the scale at that stage, Pete? What sort of revenue and employees wise at that, you know, pre-COVID? Pre-COVID, like as far back as 2016? Yeah, I guess that kind of, well, maybe say 20, when was COVID in the beginning of 2020, wasn't it? So, so 2018, 2019? 2019. Yeah. Yeah, 2019, we were probably just under 100 million Australian mm -hmm. in revenue. Um, and we'd grown from, uh, we were about 30 million in revenue in 2016. Yeah, wow. um, and we had about maybe 220, 230 team members in 2019. Yeah, wow. And were they spread, at that stage, were you in the 14 countries that you're in now? Or has some of that happened over the course of the last couple of years? No, we're in all of the countries that we're in now. We're in about 14 countries now. And that journey probably started back in 2014 when we first went into New yep. Zealand. Um, and then over the course of the next five years, we expanded into different countries, particularly in Asia. And then in right at the start of COVID, actually, um, and we'd been in discussions for a year, we had a strategic um, merge um, with a German company who was uh, about the quarter of the size of what we were then. And that was right at the, at the start of the pandemic. Fortunately or unfortunately, what doesn't break you makes you stronger, right? <laughs> Something like that. I mean, there's nothing like getting mergers and acquisitions done uh, through the center of the, the first <laughs> global pandemic that any of us have been through. <laughs> Absolutely. And then not being able to travel and not being able to communicate uh, and not being able to do all the things you normally do. It, it was an, an extraordinary time. That is, so yeah. it was it was right at that pre pandemic is when um, a, a, is when we joined joined forces with our with our German partner who we've known for about 10 years. Um, so that's why it did work, because we had some history and we had a very strong cultural alignment. 
um, with the with the leaders of that business and and also very strong personal relationships. Yep. Um, so it's not something maybe we would have done if we didn't have that historical yes. background. Yeah, no, it makes complete sense. Yeah, I mean it was it was hard enough to get deals done from an M and A perspective in COVID, you know, without the ability to you know solidify personal relationships with some, you know, with the the typical you know, lunches and dinners and Absolutely. stuff that just builds trust. And, you know, but then actually doing integration. <laughs> No, no, it's it is phenomenally difficult. It really is. And then at the same time, you know, whole parts of our business just disappeared. Um, so we're trying to grapple with two or three things at the one time. It was a little bit of a perfect storm. Wow. Um, that was a real, probably a real challenge. Probably the biggest challenge we've had since we've started, which is saying something. Well, I'm keen to take um, people on a bit of that journey. So before we do, just to give people a bit of context. So in 2016, you're a $30 million business, and this year, or you know. If, if you're comfortable talking about kind of this year, where, where's the business heading this year sure. to give a sense of that that change? Uh, this year, our revenue slated to be about 220, 230 million Australian. Wow. And we'll probably finish the year with about um, 400 team members. Um, but at the end of 2021, we're about 135, 140 million in revenue. Wow. And we've probably got about 320, 330 in team members now. Jeez. So we've got... We've been able to get through the pandemic um, and get back to our core business, which I'm sure we can talk about, because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um, we did have to have, you know, without using an well overused euphemism of pivot, <laughs> but we did have to change what we were doing yes. um, fundamentally. But the last year particularly was about getting back to our core business and making sure that that sustainable revenues and cash flows were back, um, which they are. And now we're very confident um, and we've got very ex- uh, aggressive um, growth plans and you know we're sort of a month and a or nearly two months in and we're pretty confident in the first half so I'm um, as I stand here today touch wood I'm, I'm pretty confident that our projections for this year should be should be pretty accurate which is remarkable where you think mm. back in 2016 like it's almost like it's eight times the size of the business yeah that is absolutely astronomical and the the learnings that you would have got personally uh, I expect through this uh, process Pete have been uh, pretty significant. That is significant transformation uh, over that period of time. And so I know we've we've just sort of started to drop a few, um, you know, sort of plug, you know, start to put some rabbit holes uh, that we could possibly go down. Sure. So, gonna, so what I might do sure. is, I mean, that gives people a sense of the size of the scale of the business and during which you've had to do some things very differently, but are now returning back to the core business. So maybe you can take me back to... Yes. Um, can we go back to 2005 and just talk at a starting point? Yep. What led you to start the business in the first place? Uh, well, from a personal perspective, uh, I'd um, grown, I'd gone through university and then had the um, the fortune to meet someone who was a very good person and was also a very good businessman, a guy by the name of Pete Brogan. And he ran a very good business and I'm going back in like 19, late 1990s. Mm-hmm. And so I grew up in a small business environment. And I think, um, you know, we had a team of about 30 people. We were in a suburb in um, Melbourne called Mount Waverley. And we were maybe a seven or $8 million business. And mm-hmm. Long story short, it was uh, the year 2000. And we had a uh, an international global player enter our marketing place. We were a promotional merchandise business, mm-hmm. and um, it was like a you know two thousand pound gorilla entering. You know, we were a minute, we were tiny, mm. um, and we were dealing with these large international clients like BHP and Shell, and we didn't even have a website, let alone you know <laughs> we had one office in Mount Waverley in Melbourne, um, and we didn't have a whole lot of infrastructure that you would be expecting to have. And then in comes this massive player and they um, looked at what they thought at the time were the best three companies um, in Australia in this space. And so they actually purchased us in uh, year 2000. Mm-hmm. So basically what, what had happened there is we'd then gone from a very tightly run um, small business or smaller business where I'd grown up about managing expenses and having um, incremental growth you know, of, of like one, five percent, whatever it might be, mm-hmm. to then going into a publicly listed company because we were bought by a company called Corporate Express or Staples at that time. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. um, and then I became the, the, I guess, general manager for that division and we moved to Sydney. And then we basically had a balance sheet, which I'd never had, and access to capital. And they basically said, we want you to grow this as quickly as you can. And we want success because they were on a growth multiple. 
and all of a sudden I'm in a public listed company reporting to the CEO. So it was and I was 26, 27. Wow. So as you, you said in your intro, you fake it till you make it. And that's basically what happened. But we grew that business from the seven or eight million when we sold um, Promotive, which was at the company that we were in at the time, to when I left in 2005, we'd grown that business through acquisition and organic growth. It was about half 50% acquisition, 50% organic. Mm -hmm. And we'd grown that to a $65 million business by the time oh. it was 2005. So we were we were probably in the top ten advertising agencies in the country as a as a division of this ostensibly office products company, and no one had ever heard us. So from my perspective, um, I also realised that corporate life probably wasn't for me, um, mm -hmm. and that I was looking for maybe something a little bit different. Because, um, well, to be honest, the, the the culture, the people that worked at the time, and the team that we'd built were fantastic, but we were a small. Um, we were a small division in a in a very large company. A large ship, yeah. Yeah, and we were um, we were a marketing driven and services um, division that was within the infrastructure of a product driven business. So it became whilst we learnt a lot and we grew that business, you know, tenfold in those years. Um, it, it taught me enormous lessons in terms of um, if you don't have to worry about capital, how quickly you can grow. Um, and mm. profitability, if that's not a key for a year or two, which it wasn't, we could take some risks that we could never do when we're a smaller business. And yeah. so what I sort of got was a grounding in terms of um, the best of both worlds, which is a very unique position. Mm. And I'm very fortunate to have had that. Um, yes. But also importantly, culturally, I saw the very best in a small business and what that means where people actually care about each other to a corporate business where you could sort of walk in missing an arm and uh, there's something different about you. I don't know what yeah. it is, but, <laughs> you know, but people, the rules of the game in a large corporate are such that you just don't have the scope to be able to be who you really are um, mm. and have time to treat people as people. You sort of, you feel like battery yeah. hens sometimes in the mm. farm and you've just got to do your job and you're a cog in the wheel. And that's when, from my perspective, that wasn't where I saw myself um, as a future. And so what I realised, and, and I took a bit, I had to have like nine months gardening leave. And as I did that, I actually, um, for the first time since I'd you know, gone to uni and been working and you just get into the process of just working really hard without thinking about what you want to do or, or where you want to go or who you want to be. And what, what I realised during that process, I did about 20 different jobs for a day trying to work out what I want to do as a I rang a real estate agent and said, look, I want to I want to work in a real estate agent for two days. And I just did that just for free, just to see if it was what I wanted. I went mm -hmm. and worked at a corporate banker for a couple of days. It's amazing. Um, I worked, wow. worked in a plasticine factory just because I thought maybe it would be a good idea to buy a business. And, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. But during that process, over about three months where I tried all the different things, I realised that it was less important what I did which is what I had started out thinking, and it was more important how I was doing it and who I was doing it. And that's where the mm -hmm. biggest revelation came to me about culture and about people. And what I realised at, at the big corporate that I'd been at is the business was successful but despite itself and despite the way it treated mm -hmm. people as cogs in that machine. Imagine mm -hmm. if you could create a business that was the best of both worlds, that had that sort of small business feel, we actually care about each other, but it had that scale where you could actually invest and create competitive advantage. And that's basically mm -hmm. what, what led me to start Zinc because I couldn't, and this is back in 2005, so, you know, the Googles of the world sort of were embryonic as well at that stage. Um, yeah. And I actually worked in an advertising agency for um, two days, and that was probably the worst cultural experience that I've ever had. It was just dog eat dog. So I wasn't going to jump from the frying pan into the fire. So that's when I thought, well, if I can't find what I'm looking for, maybe what we need to do is create it. So I took mm. two months to write a business plan. And that business plan, the first sort of half dozen pages were all on the culture and the, and the why um, and what we would build and the type of team and the people um, and the what came second, and, and which is not often how the business plans mm. sort of get written. But I guess for me, yeah. it was the motivator of, of what was driving me. And I was thinking if I could then find people that were motivated by the same intrinsic things, not, not just extrinsic motivators like money, but some intrinsic mm. things in, with regard to the passion or the way you treat people or the type of culture that you build, 
how extraordinary could it be for discretionary effort or working with people where you try and take out all the impediments that get in the way? Um, and that's sort of where, where Zinc started from because I'd worked with some people wow. who shared that. Um, some other guys had some very key, um, shared some same values. Um, we all put money in together, and that's been a big part of how we created Zinc at the start is for people to be self-directional, to have have discretion mm -hmm. over how they're going to drive their lives and what they're doing. Um, and I wanted people to be able to share in that value, um, which is a very Michael Porter concept, that concept of shared value, that a company can't just be about profit. It's got to be about creating value and then sharing that value. And, and it's how you share mm -hmm. that value that is key. And that's really what drove the start of, of Zinc and the team and the journey we're on. And we've made enormous mistakes over the way. Um, and we're really starting to have some great success now in the last three years. But, you know, it's been a 16 or 17 year overnight sensation. Yeah, that's right. You know, people can hear the numbers we were talking about before and like, oh, wow, why haven't I thought of the idea that's going to take me from 30 million to 200 million? It's like, it's not, <laughs> it's no. not you've just ignored the previous 15 yes, years. Yes. Got you. Got you into that position. Yeah, wow. And so what would be a practical example of how um, shared value shows up in the business today when you think about how that sort of you know, culture has, has turned into something that you're proud of? Yeah. How does it practically show up? Um, how that practically shows up for us is we, um, we try and have that conversation with the guys all the time, our team, in terms of, um, you know, not just asking, um, which is what most people do in most businesses, you know, what can – what can this business do for me? You know, what money can I earn? What? And that's a fair enough question, and you need to be able to answer that. But there also needs to be another question, which is what can I do for this business or this team? Because ultimately, if everyone who's in the team at Zinc went and stood in the street, the business is in the street. It's not the buildings and the infrastructure and the processes. So when I talk about a business, I'm actually talking about a team, which is um, a difficult thing to scale well, which is what I'm learning, but we are doing it. So I guess how it practically starts is you've got to ask two sides of that question. What what can I do for the team or the business, but also what can that business do for me? And leaders, as we are in our business, we need to be asking both of those questions as well. So how that practically translate is, is we've identified four key stakeholder groups within our business that share in that shared value, like our team. Mm -hmm. It's got to start with our team. Um, it's then our, our client partners, our supply partners, and then our community partners. And if I look at our team, how this practically executes there is we're saying to our, um, our team, what's going to make Zinc the best place in the world for you to work at? What makes Zinc a great place to work? Um, and we have a range of initiatives in place, feedback sessions, cultural sessions, where we're trying to create exactly that. So there was some years ago where the team wanted uh, more time off. So we created Zinc Leave, which is, you know, an extra week's hold. If you're here for a certain time and the business is succeeding, um, you'll get up to a, a, another um, paid week a year leave. And, you know, that can set to grow. Recently, some of the guys have been talking about how can we get equity, how can we get shares in Zinc? So we're looking at how we can develop something like that. And then it's all the other practical mm -hmm. things, like we have a gym or we support people's mental or physical health. Um, we've historically brought in nutritionists. We've historically brought in um, financial planners and a whole range of things to help people um, that, are, that, are, that are team, that are company funded to be able to help people outside of their direct role, if you know what I mean. Because, you know, yeah. I want people to be as real as they are with, I'm the same person I am with my kids as I am with you, as I am with my team here. Um, and when when people come to work, that's the type of people that I want to be able to work with and that I think they share those same values. Um, and we try and get rid of all the things that get in the way or obstacles that get in the way of people getting on along with people. And if we can make some of the yeah. internal stuff easier, like, you know, the guys work very hard for their money um, and, they, and they work very passionately and very diligently. So if we can think about that and help them by bringing a financial planner to get their money to work harder for them, and maybe take some outside stresses off because they feel more centered, more calm, more focused, and that they've got a path or a journey that they're on, then awesome. It's going to help, you know, we, we don't, our lives aren't in boxes. They're, they're, you're one whole person. And I guess that's what we're trying to, to bring in and sort of remove that whole work-life balance scenario is a little bit of a misnomer. 
um, because we're one person, mm. you know? Yeah. And I think um, I love the way that you talk about that because uh, I think it's very easy for companies to go, well, I want to be on the you know best places to work list. And so, and, I, and everyone else has got, you know, ping pong tables and a gym membership and a food yep. thing. And, a, you know, yeah, yeah, they go through the list, but actually the reason for it is not yes. there or the understanding of why all this stuff actually yes. matters. And the fact that anyone who's having to separate their personality from, you know, who they are to who Absolutely. they are at work, that's an incredibly stressful um, yes. existence and which leads to not only poor products, I mean, that's not a good culture. That's not going to be somebody who's showing up and no. actually adding to the culture. You know, I know I hear some people talk about cultural fit uh, and I think, yeah, like cultural fit's important, um, but you've got to be careful that you haven't made a culture in your own mind that's so finite and so defined and it's got so many hard lines around it that it yeah, can't absolutely. evolve because you're bringing, as you said, your culture yes. is your people. Um, it's the collective you yes. know, energy, interactions, yes. thinking, productivity of those people. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. is the culture. So if you've said, no, no, it's like this. And if you don't fit that, then you're out. I'm like, yeah, but then there's no cultural no, no. evolution. And that's right. Um, I think I think, I think, think it's a really good point. That. And I guess the one thing I'm very clear about, I can't control the culture. Like there's no way. I can try and guide mm. it and we can try and set a purpose and values that people share and align to in terms of the purpose. But um, that's all we can do because people are individuals. And, and it's, a, mm. it's a bit of an, a, an old metaphor, but I, I sort of think of it like a quilt you know, where each individual square mm. is a person, but over time, the shape and the colours and the feel of that is going to change as the business evolves and grows. Um, as people come and join yeah. the team and as people um, leave the team and go on a different journey, this, this is constantly evolving. Mm. But what we can keep clear is the purpose that we're driving towards um, and the why of the business, but also the values are almost like the filters of how we make decisions every day to try and get to that place. But I can't mm. tell people, you know, mm. what to do. And I'm, I, you know, you've got to be able to hire great people, um, develop a, 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 an environment that's built on trust and transparency. Um, that's very clear. Um, and then you've got to sort of get out of the road. And, and, and I think the point yeah. you make about cultural fits an important one because it does have to be an iron fist in a velvet glove. Like, we don't have – we try and have few rules. So if you're sick, you don't – I don't want a sick, sick leave certificate. You have to prove to me that you're sick. We will take you on face value that you're mm. sick. But the first time that you lie or that's abused, you can't work here, um, even if your performance is good because mm -hmm. that's going to be the bad apple that sets the whole rules in place of trying to do the right thing. Yeah. So people sort of get it or don't get it. Mm. And not everyone – Zinc does not suit everyone, and it's not about being bad or good, but you do mm. have to have a fit in on certain levels, and, and, and you've got to continue yep. to, and that's a lesson I've learned, you've got to continue to re-engage that because I'm not the same person I was five years ago. So just because you've got a team member that's really engaged mm. and, and happy today, they might not be that in three or four years' time, and the business has changed, and the requir our client yeah. requirements have changed, and so that's why you've got to have a, a, a framework, which is what we've got. We call it the Zinky Journey, where people, we check in on a regular basis and we have these feedback sessions because the shape and the, and the colour and the, and the flavour of the, of the team is changing all the time. And I used to think, you know, mm. oh, just if I get there, you know, that revenue figure or that EBITDA figure or, you know, we open one more country. It, it just, it, it really is about the journey. And I'm understanding that now, like I actually understand it better. I think I've intellectually understood yeah. the concept, but I'm actually emotionally um, not looking for the end now. I'm, I'm emotionally saying, well, I'm on this journey now as a, as a team member of Zinc and, and trying to be a better leader as I'm going along to the point that, that I'm going to keep adding value. But there's no end point because, you know, it's like the human condition. You can just no. keep evolving and being better and challenging ourselves. So, Well, it's very easy to fall into that trap of, uh, of also yes. when things are hard, of just seeing the next milestone you need to get to go, everything yes. will be better. We just need to get yes. to there and then everything will be good or that everything will be better then. I used to have a running joke with my um, the first CEO I'd worked really close with, uh, closely with where we said, you know, 
and this this joke ran for about three years uh we were like you know everything will be fine when we get yes. to easter because we'd said yeah. that you know uh, it was must have been february or something we were we just discovered that the business was losing three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a quarter and yes. which was not what we were told when we took over the business and we were like okay you know things will be better when we get to easter and we've solved this problem then you get to easter and of course yes. there's new problems and you're thinking okay we just need to get to july and by the time we get to july everything will be settled it'll be good and no no you're right it was just you know the you're ongoing right. um i think actually tony tony robbins summed it up beautifully he said you know if i in, in the context of the journey because of course journeys you know it's a it's a very widely used word but when you think about as the founder when do you yep. get to enjoy it so That's at what point, point. You know, this is what you've obviously wrestled with and come to a resolution, but it's like, well, at what point do I get to enjoy this journey? Is it when I hit that goal? Is it when I hit that revenue number? Is it when I hit that EBITDA number? Is it when I sell? Is it when I you know, raise? Like what, what is the mechanism? Because if you're waiting for all the stars to align and everything to be great, um, I think Tony Robbins said it the, the best, you know, he said, well, I've got, I think his, his companies now do something like 6 billion in revenue. He's like, I've got 12 companies. I've got thousands of employees. He said, if I had to wait for a day where everybody was doing everything to my standard, yeah. the way I would hope that it would be done and weren't screwing it up, weren't losing money, weren't like making terrible decisions, he goes, I would never, no. ever, ever have a good day. He goes, because it's, not, it's just not possible. So I have to find a way to enjoy that journey. As you say, I have to, have to find a way of being enjoying the complexities, the imperfections, the stuff that doesn't work. And actually I have to enjoy all of that. Otherwise this is gonna be an yes. absolutely awful ride until it finishes and i'll almost be compelled to self-sabotage the the journey to to yes. make it easier to control or less scary or you know to kind of bring it back in rather than letting it expand as you said you can't control the culture you have to continue to imbue it and and uh, and guide it but that's right you, that's exactly you're also right. a participant and it's like um i think it's exactly right and the point wow. you made um re um tony robbins is correct as well and that's something i've had to learn personally over the years um, because everyone works differently. You know, I know a lot of people that are driven to start businesses or do things. Um, and like you said, in sports people as well, there's sometimes there are parts of their personality that are uh, a little bit different to most people who will just sort of, you know, coast along, whereas other people are driven by certain things. And you've got to manage those expectations that everyone's not going to work the same hours or in the same way or to the same intensity or the same level as you and it's it's having the maturity mm. which happens through time to respect that because it be, can become a disincentive to the people that you're dealing with and i've i've had that over the years for sure where i've been disincentivizing to people because it's you know i wouldn't expect I, I would ask nothing of anyone that i wouldn't ask of myself but um people have got different yeah you know ways of doing things True. Sure. Pete, I'd love to get into, um, I know we're, we, you and I could probably talk for three or four hours. And so we're going to have to try sure. to condense some of these. Um, I, I want to get as much value, of sure. course, out of your mind and your journey as I possibly can in the time we've got available. There's three, there's three areas I'd really love to, three or four areas I'd love to dig into. You would have got some very interesting learnings in yes. your international expansion strategy because expanding internationally is yes. really easy on paper in an, in an Excel sheet yes. uh, and very hard to do yes. in practice. And I expect you got some learnings there. Um, you went through you went through a merger sort of merger acquisition um, process, and you were doing that remotely. So I'm really interested to get some um, insights uh, out of that. And then, of course, what we haven't talked about in, in any more detail is the strategic changes sure. you had to make when COVID happened uh, and the existing business you know model got disrupted, and what you've and you've now sort of returned it far more back to the core business model. But there would have been some interesting uh, learning. So can we maybe start with the international expansion when you think about the, the attempts to uh, uh, expand internationally, the sequencing with the way you did it, what, what learnings have you, when you reflect on the path, things that you wish you'd known perhaps if you were thinking about expanding internationally and you were a, someone who's thinking about it today, you're somebody in our community, they haven't gone international before and they're thinking about sure. what, what, what do they need to know to make sure they do a better job? Sure. Uh, well, or the I best think, job possible, um, I should say. Well, the, and please, everyone can learn from our mistakes because we have made a, a number of them. And I think that's probably the first learning is you've got to, you know, as the sale, as the saying goes, you've got to fail fast um, and you've got to be really open and brutally honest with what you're doing well and what you're not doing well. Because if you pretend, even for a short period of time, it just costs you money and costs you time. Um, and eventually, depending on your capital base and your cash flows and also the capacity of your leadership team, because 
we were growing organically in the markets we were in as the same time we were trying to expand. So we're, we're trying to develop a leadership group um, right. and um, the internal infrastructure capacity for expansion. We've also got to manage the cash flow and the financial sides of it, as well as manage the organic growth, the success that we're already having in the, in the market or markets we're in. So I think um, the mistakes are the first thing. Be, be willing and open to them straight away and, and learn because you will make them. I mean, that's the one thing is do your plan and know whatever, whatever you plan to do, that's exactly what won't happen. But you've got a you've, emergent strategy, I think, is the great term mm -hmm. everyone uses. So I use it all the time. That's an emergent strategy. I mean, I had yeah. a plan and now it's we're up to like, you know, version four um, because it keeps changing because we make mistakes, but we learn from them. Yeah. I think the second thing for us was um, if you can start yeah. small to do your learnings and mistakes small, that's good. So the first market we expanded into was New Zealand. So if you're in Australia, that's a very um, easy place to do because you can work out some of the obvious things there. Um, the next market we expanded to was China and we sort of stuffed that up three times. Uh, but we got it right the, the last time and but we were nearly at the point of, of giving up and China this year will be 50% of our revenues because that is one of the fastest growing parts of our business. Wow. Um, you know, and, and you go back to 2015, 2014, we were basically a 100% Australian owned company um, just doing revenues in Australia. And we had an idea saying, hey, you know, we're in a market of 25 million mm -hmm. and we're doing this, this and this. If we did exactly the same things and spent the same amount of time and, you know, had the same strategy, if that strategy is right, if we took that to a market that's 10 times or 50 times larger, are we going to get a better return on that? And the answer is clearly yes. And that's why we thought we would um, we would have a go. And that's exactly what we did. So I think um, I think that would be the third thing is is once you've made your initial forays and you've tried to work some smaller things out and you've made some obvious mistakes, do be ambitious. Do do try um, and uh, take on the world. I, I think um, Australian businesses are extraordinarily successful. It's almost like our sports people sometime. And I think this comes down to our um, mentality and the way that we approach things. Like we're very down to earth and, you know, we do a lot of business in Europe and in the US and um, in Asia. And Australia, Australian businesses we see regularly are punching well above their weight, um, respectively, in all these arenas. And it's normally because we will have it, we will have a go. Um, where maybe there's a little anti-authoritarian streak in this where if someone says we can't do it, well, that's exactly what we will do. Um, we will back ourselves and we're very brutal and we're very honest in terms, in a candid way, not not in a nasty way, in terms of what we can and can't do. Um, whereas, you know, sometimes in, in, in different cultures, yeah. um, that can be smoothed out. But I really like the, the rawness and the, and the honesty, I guess, of, of, of um, what we've grown up in and, and our culture. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think it translates well, it's really well. well. Mm. And we're very well liked, like, because we are those things yeah. and we're generally pretty mm -hmm. honest and ethical as well. Mm. So that would be the probably the, the, the next thing yeah. with regard to that. And the last thing would be get your capital base right. Like, you are going to run Beautiful. out of money or there are going to be problems that you have not foreseen and you have to have that buffer to be able to do it. Um, and that's the bit that twice we nearly came undone. Um, both times because we had more success, like we were planning for the worst. And the opposite happened where we actually grew quicker and our working capital requirements went through the roof and it nearly crushed us. So um, this is where you've got to have your capital base would probably be yeah. and your cash flow set up as much as you can before you do it. I haven't seen the source of the stat yet, so I, I don't have the reference point, but I was told that 50% of the business fail once you've passed the sort of you know year one you know getting out of small business 50% yep. of businesses that fail when they're scaling fail in the in the 12 months following their record year yes uh, of growth yes uh, which makes a lot of sense for exactly the reason that you've just described you know it's it's very easy to assume the worst and it could go really well so if you don't have your ducks in the row you can run out of cash super fast yes um it just yeah you know, can can really uh, impact you what about can i just make a so point tell me about the, on that Sean sorry I yes think, please I mate. Think there's yeah. two points on that one is it's the cash flow, but I think it's the other thing is recognising what your strengths are because I think there's a lot of people that start small businesses that are very good salespeople or very good in a small business environment. And once you have that mm. growth, 
you've then got to start focusing on the next level of infrastructural growth or systems or process or physical like offices even. And what I've found, and, and a lot, we've made a lot of acquisitions as, as we've been growing as well, that it's that stage where a business gets to four or five million dollars and they've got to take that next stage of growth. Often people get distracted working in the business or they start working on the business as opposed to focusing on the things that had made them successful initially. And they get lost in all the mm. infrastructural things um, that becomes a real problem. And I guess that's one thing that we mm. took away when we started Zinc. Like, and I probably should have mentioned this before, like we started Zinc with a 200 seat phone system. Um, we started, we opened two offices in Melbourne and Sydney the day we opened um, and we developed a cap capital base, but I'd made a lot of acquisitions when I was at Corporate Express. And the one thing I'd seen, most small businesses, when they hit between five and sort of seven million, they tend to fall over because they start focusing on all the things that aren't revenue or client based. And sometimes guys aren't mm. good at that. And maybe what you need to do is think about bringing someone in to let you keep focusing on what you are, do, are good at. Um, and so we try to avoid that from day one. And I think it's been one of the reasons for our success. It's high risk. Mm. And we certainly invested out of the curve. It was almost like wearing dad's jacket, you know, when you when you when when it was just way too big and you sort of grew into it. But um, And we when we started our business, we had one client, you know, so it was an extraordinary risky thing to do, but it's certainly something that if you're focusing on growth, you've got to build your infrastructure ahead of what you actually need. Because if you're trying to chase it all the time, you'll just, you'll drown. It's like trying to give a drowning man a drink. It's yeah. just impossible. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, you know, you end up doing a lot of brand damage yes. uh, on the way yes. up because you end up making promises you just can't deliver Absolutely. on because the, the processes don't scale, the people, you know, the service doesn't scale, yes. the, you know, nothing's... And it's a really, and that's, you know, that's typically, that's what I end up working with founders on is exactly as you said, is putting in the founding, putting, putting all the foundational um, building blocks in before you need them, yes. before they're going to be a Absolutely. problem. Because if I can see somebody getting close to 30 people and I'm thinking, but you don't have this, you don't have this, you don't yep. have this, you don't have this. And at 30 people, you are going to massively struggle as a founder because you've been managing yes. everyone by that stage. You've been Absolutely. dictating everybody's priorities. You've got no management structure yes. probably or very yep. light. Um, and, you know, you're you're going to fall in a hole uh, mentally and emotionally. Yes. Um, you know, you're not personally going to survive that journey to 50 Absolutely. without some, some major infrastructure. Yes. Uh, and leadership. Yeah, and, and it's totally all about people, saying. you know. And I think if you hire the right people yeah. and you've built that right culture from the start, you'll tend to be able to adapt and grow with some of those things. So, you know, mm. you, you will have to invest in infrastructure and process and all those things before. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to have the people first to be able to help facilitate and manage it. So I totally agree with you. Pete, one of the things that, um, one of the things that we haven't talked about, but I think, you know, in, in the time that we've got available, I'd really love to unpack is, in COVID, you had to make a transition, um, you know, some, some new products and services that maybe you hadn't been focused on yes. before and you were talking about the fact it's kind of returning to core business. Can you just take people very quickly through what actually changed, what did you have to do? And as a result of now kind of being, well, let's say on the other side of it, yeah. when you look back, what are the learnings about that period sure. for you? Yeah, so absolutely. You well, I guess the key us? thing we did at day one is make sure that we protected the team. So this was really at the start of March when, um, you know, everything just started going sideways. And I think everyone, you know, through um, December and January and early February thought this was a China problem or it was an Asia problem and it'd be like SARS or it'd be like whatever and it'll sort of peter out over there. And then all of a sudden it just started going sideways and it went sideways really quickly and then everything's just shutting down. So I guess the key thing we did was make sure our team felt protected and I remember standing up in front of the team and we told everyone, you know, and I remember doing it in front of the Australian team, that we're not going to be, we've got the um, capacity to work through this and we're going to do everything we can and not let any single team member go. Because that's the first thing is you've got to make sure everyone feels solid. Now, if you can't do that, I would have been saying whatever it is I needed to say, good news, bad news or ugly, you've got to be telling the team constantly what's happening. And that's what we were doing through that those first few months is making sure everyone knew what was happening and had a very clear picture on reality. We weren't hiding anything because we didn't know what was going to happen. But here were our intentions and these are the plans we had. And we were sharing profit and cash flow figures with everyone 
so that they knew exactly what was what was going on. Um, and I guess the key thing for us, one of the biggest areas of our business had been our entertainment marketing division. And this is very much centred around the um, uh, cinema channel, you know, in terms of movie theatres. And that was one of the hardest hit uh, and theme parks. And these were one of the hardest hit areas that just basically stopped overnight. Um, and, and we had some significant, we had a $10 million debtor in China that also just stopped overnight. So we had, you know, a couple of million dollars worth of goods on the water on boats that were being delivered to 45 different countries around the world. And the cinemas are basically open on Friday and they've shut on Monday. So we've got all these consignments that are going, but they've got no one to take them because we couldn't, we were calling and obviously borders are shut, travel's gone. Um, no one was responding because um, we're calling, we're emailing, but everyone's shut down, literally. So we had to warehouse all those goods. Um, and then we had a team, a whole team sitting there that after a week or two basically had nothing to do because this was not ending. And this is where we asked ourselves the question of what, what where are our clients spending and what are they doing? And it was just a, a, a you know, and this is where I think good entrepreneurs and good leaders adapt and move quickly and this is where and it's not something unique like lots of people did different things but in our instance it was then understanding that well the one thing clients were still spending money on was PPE and because we've got such a strong supply chain in China and because um, because we've got four offices in China we're able to um, pivot the supply chain we had to PPE and we were able to um, provide um, personal protective equipment, which is PPE, to governments and um, a range of statutory authorities in the next three months when no one else could. Um, and things were, it was like, um, I don't know if you guys have seen that movie War Dogs. It's, it's hilarious about the arms dealer and it just goes out of control. This is, this is what it was but with PPE, where there was just no rules and there was just, you know, freight. Freight increased almost tenfold over a week. You know, we were chartering whole planes leaving China, going to New Zealand, going to America, where we'd just never done some of these things before. But because we had a team that felt protected and looked after and solid, which was based on a culture of trust, mm -hmm. um, we had and and we hadn't done some of these things before. We were um, we were open to changing and adapting very quickly. And that's basically exactly what we did. So it, it was an extraordinary time. And I think we did something like 85, or, sorry, 110 to $120 million of sales of PPE in like 12 weeks or 14 weeks. Wow. I didn't have, we didn't have a day off. There was a core group of people who didn't have a day off for that three months. But what it did do was get us through that period. And we've hardly sold any PPE since mm. 2020. So it is an extraordinary wow. story. Wow, and then the amazing. supply and chain caught up. And then, and your... you know, we're not competitive now with regard to what other people can do. But at the time, for some yeah. um, countries, and we were dealing with Walmart uh, in the US, like we were supplying some big um, domestic, uh, we were supplying Amazon as well in the US, um, as well as New Zealand, Australia, and also mm. in Europe. Um, it was an extraordinary wow. time. And Absolutely what a, extraordinary. Um, what an incredible uh, I always think, you know, out of, you know, people say, you know, don't waste a crisis and so on. But, but the thing, the, the thing about that for me yes. is it's, yes, that sometimes, you know, there's big uh, financial opportunities that come in crisis if you're quick to move and so on. But for me, it's more about your culture. Yes. What are people going to take away from this as a story forevermore as a result of actually how the business responded, how people were treated, how people came together, what they end up doing. And that I can imagine has been an incredible um, cultural uh, sort of, symbol story you know that for your business forever people are like you should have seen what we were doing you know like that the way the business protected us that gave us the opportunity to be creative and to to figure out like no one had charted a plane before how do we do that i don't know like just talking to just figure it out <laughs> you know just getting stuff done yeah, and, but yeah, the, yeah. through that process the business survived and what's happening now is that it's coming back to its you know to its roots and its core products and core services as the markets return absolutely and what an incredible journey for your team to go on absolutely but it's also, we, we, I mean, we had to borrow a lot of money during that time as well. Um, and, yeah, we're still paying that money through because we literally had debtors that weren't paying us for 12 yeah. months. So um, 
But in that time as well, and this is a part of this shared value concept, we went back to all team members um, and just about every team member in every country took a pay cut of some description because we gave them the option. We basically said, you know, in this room, there are X amount of people, 10% of these people can't be here or we all take a 10% pay cut and we can, we can all get through this together. And, and, you know, that's one of the proudest moments I've, I've had being at Zinc is when your team sits there and they're all willing to sacrifice for each other. Yeah. And the leadership group had sacrificed twice as much. They'd sacrificed 20% mm -hmm. of their salary and for months earlier, as they should, because that's exactly good leaders eat last and that's exactly the way it should be. Um, but that's an extraordinary thing to be a part of. And, and the mutual obligation, I think you feel, is, um, is extraordinary. So, you know, and, it's, and, it's, and, and then as soon as we could, and it varied in different countries, we were trying to get people back to full yeah. salaries, which we could. Um, and obviously there was various government initiatives that really supported that. Uh, and then that took us 12 months to get our cash flows back and to try and work out with our debtors to try and stabilise the business. Because it, But, you know, we had this extraordinary growth um, and we had these extraordinary opportunities, but we had to fund mm. them. No, yeah. It always keeps coming 100%. back to funding. 100%. Yeah, we, I, mean, I did exactly the same thing in the company I was running at the time. Uh, and to your point, the, the, the level of joy you get as a leader, seeing people willing to, you know, willing to put their personal selves aside for the greater good. And actually, one of the things I think that's one of the lovely things about our culture also nationally is that we're generally a relatively collectivist culture. And when you see very individualistic yes. cultures where that's just not in the DNA, you know, it's me before everybody Absolutely. else where we're kind of like, Hey, we'll, we'll sacrifice for the group. If it gets us all a better outcome, that's a beautiful Australian yes. thing, but to show that, you know, that's all, and it's all easy to say and it's very nice, but when it impacts you personally and your family, and you've got to take that story home and tell your partner or, you know, whoever is at home, it's like, Hey, what, we're going to have to, we're going to have to make some changes. So actually this group, you know, this group of people can still succeed. It's um, not easy. Absolutely. Pete, um, I think it's less okay. collectivist and more egalitarian mm. is what I'd say. Mm. Like, and I think that's that real essence of mateship that you see in the Australian culture that I think is extraordinary, yeah. where people will give you the shirt off their back. But, you know, as long as, and it's got to be built on trust, as long as when you need a hand, mm -hmm. that you're going to be there, yeah. you know. And I, I think that's a terrific thing about how we do things. Mm, that's beautiful. Um, Pete, we are out of time, but I have one question that I need to ask you that I ask all, um, sure. all founders that I've interviewed on this um, podcast. Uh, I want you to um, imagine that you have go out and I don't know how, how long it's going to be before you're finished you know, building businesses, how long this journey is, but let's imagine you're in your yearning years and you're you know, getting a bit older. <laughs> you're, still, you're very wise and you, you've still got all your marbles with you. And, um, and the CEO of uh, the world's largest global community of first-time founders, you know, tens of millions of people around the world who are all sort of dialed in looking for opportunities to learn from wisdom from people who've, you know, really succeeded in building the kind of businesses that they'd love to build. And she asks you for your three above all else's. You know, Pete, you've got, you've got to crystallize the three most important things that founders need to get right if they actually want to be able to scale their business and therefore, you know, their impact and their, and their cultures. What are the three things yep. that you think the founders need to get right above all else? I think you've got to get your people right first. I think you've got to get people that are going to share the same values and that will sign up for the purpose um, and that will do hard yards when they occur because there will be some. I think you've then got to get your culture right and they're very different. Like people's almost your hardware and software's and culture's almost your software. Like you can't have the greatest computer in the world with buggy software mm. and nor can you have great software with ordinary hardware. So to me, you've then got to work on your culture. And, and for me, that, that premise was around shared value or a more conscious form of capitalism that, that's occurring now where it doesn't have to be a, a zero-sum game. And probably the last thing would be um, your capital base, your cash flow. They would be the three things, mm. probably in that order, that mm. I would be really suggesting people focus on. Yeah, that sounds like the way that you built uh, built your business from everything you said today, Pete. So yeah, absolutely, uh, look, Had a great just, team. Yeah, one hundred percent. And I just look, I'd really like to acknowledge you before we go for the way that you've built this business because lots of people can talk about um, culture and lots of people talk about team. 
what's really um, what's really obvious to me in the way that you've talked about it is how much this is actually part of who you are, what fundamentally drives you as a human and as a leader uh, in business, and the and the the dialogue around actually just being able to show up as the same individual in every single scenario and create an environment where everybody else is not only expected to, but is sort of required to. And that is the culture. And if we can't yeah. do that, then we don't like, what are we doing here? That is yeah, a beautiful, yeah. um, that's a beautiful thing for people to be part of. And so I feel very excited for your uh, team that they've been able to participate in a business that has that kind of leadership. So congratulations um, to you and to your oh, leaders in your team. I know it's not easy. Um, no. Before we go, Pete, how can people um, get in touch with you or follow along with what the business is doing if they want to sort of stay, stay connected? Yeah, if they wanted to. I mean, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, at Peter D. Cleary or it's just go on the Zinc website um, www.zinc.com mm -hmm. um, is probably the, the key ways um, and if we can help I mean we're here to help it's too life's too hard not to not to share and help each other out a bit so um, we don't have all the answers but if we can we're happy to beautiful thanks so much Pete well uh, folks I really hope you enjoyed the show today with uh, with Pete Cleary from Zinc big thanks to you Pete uh, before you go today, if you've got an opportunity, yep, of course, we'd love a review. Feel free to jump on the scalespodcast.com uh, website. You can pop your email there and you'll hear about uh, new episodes before they launch. Or if you're a bit more of a social animal, you can find us on at Scalats Podcast on any of your favorite socials. But for everybody listening today, you have heard a journey that's gone over a pretty significant period of time. So before you get, you know, dazzled by the numbers that Pete and his team have achieved in the last really between yes. you know, 2016 to go from 30 to, you know, uh, north of 200 in, in seven, it's like seven years, something like that, six years. Yep. Um, remember that there was a pretty significant journey before 2016 Absolutely. that occurred to actually build all that infrastructure and those foundations to get there. And the only thing that guarantees that you cannot scale is actually giving up. So you have to stay unshakable in your faith that you get there, but remain flexible in your approach and just do not give up. You've just got to stick at it. Stay with it. You've been listening to the Scale Arts Podcast. I'm Sean Steele. I uh, look forward to speaking with you all again next week. Thanks so much, Pete. G'day, everyone. Just a couple of quick things before you go. If you have questions that you'd love myself or an upcoming guest to tackle about challenges that you're facing in scaling your business, please just jump straight on the website, scaleupspodcast.com. You can record your message straight from your mobile by hitting the button on the right-hand side of the page, or you can just email them the old-fashioned way, questions at scaleupspodcast.com. And just a quick reminder, nothing we spoke about today constitutes financial or business advice. If you are considering making big decisions in your business, seek out a professional who can look at your situation in detail and make sure you're getting sound, personalized advice. Thanks for listening. Look forward to being back in your podcast feed next week. Bye.